Courageous failure. Courageous failure. Now, I know that sounds like contradictory terms, and we mentioned that last week, but basically, and I'm going to grab my little friend here that I had last week. I didn't leave. I didn't go nowhere. I'm coming back. But last week, I brought out this little pop-up toy that, that I had so much fun with last week, I just brought it back just to, just to have some more fun. But what this series really is all about, these three-part series about courageous failure, it's really how can we turn our defeats into victories? Come on, how, how many, how many uh, would like to turn a defeat into victory? How many would like to see a victory this morning? Come on, hold it up high and proud. We want to believe God for a victory today. And, and, and that's what it's all about. And, and what we're talking about in this series is that when we, when we fall down or when we get knocked down, I mean, you know, God wants us to have the courage Amen. to get back up Amen. and to bounce back. That's what we're talking about when we talk about courageous failure. And last week we explained to you that our series big idea, this, this one statement that kind of summarizes all three weeks and we've broken it into three parts, is this, that a key to success in life, a key to success in life is our perception, say perception, our perception of failure, our understanding of the forces at work in failure, and our response to failure. And so we're taking that big idea, we're breaking it into three parts. Last week, we looked at our perception of failure. We need to if we're going to be successful, we have to have the right perception of failure. And then this week, we're going to look at understanding the forces that are at work in failure. And then next week, in our third part, we're going to talk about our response to failure. And really, we need to hear this all together as a three-part message to get the full impact of what I believe God wants us to share. So a key to success is our perception of failure, our understanding of the forces at work, and our response to failure. Now last week our key question was what is our perception then of failure? You know, we never usually like to talk about failure, we don't like to think about failure, but we all have a perception of failure. And we told you last week that having the right perception, and we gave you three points last week, we talked about that failure was inevitable, Failure is profitable, and failure is redeemable. And if you missed last week's message, again, if, I want you to get that. We've got to get all three parts of this to get the full message. You can go to the website or the YouTube channel and catch that. So today, we want to ask this question. What are the forces that are at work in failure? Do you realize that there's a lot of things going on, some things that are not seen, that take place in life that affect us and are forces that are at work when it comes to failure. So today we're going to kind of look behind the scenes, and Woody, we're going to look under the hood. You know, a mechanic likes to, you got to look under the hood to see the inner workings to see the engine and see the carburetor and see all those things. And today we're going to look at certain forces that are under the hood, behind the scenes, that are at work in failure. Now, I'm going to start by telling you a story. Now, I'm going to put a disclaimer in right here, okay? So listen to the story, hear me out. And as I tell you this story this morning... I want you to notice the different forces at work in this story. Notice different factors that go into this story. A little bird was going flying south for the winter. As it began to cross over Canada and into the United States and heading south, the weather was so cold that one of the forces was that the bird froze and fell out of the sky and landed in a field and buried in the snow. Popped his head up, but he was stuck in the snow. Then, as he was struggling in the snow, a cow came by 
and stood right over him and I'm going to say it on Sunday morning, he pooped. I told you, I'm putting a disclaimer in there. Okay, pastor said poop. I'm going to say it a few other times this morning <laughs> on a Sunday morning, okay? A cow came by, sat over the bird, and pooped on him. Another force. So we've got the frozen weather. We've got the, okay. So here he is. And actually, the irony of it is that the warmth from the, oh, come on began to melt some of the snow and began to actually thaw him out a little bit and he was starting to feel like, hey, I'm going to get out of this mess. And he starts to sing. Well, another force. A cat hears him sing. And a cat comes over and sees him buried in the, you know what, My mom really probably wouldn't have liked me saying poop in church, I know. God bless her in heaven. Mom, if you hear me, it's okay, trust me. <laughs> the cat hears the bird singing, and he goes over, and he starts to dig him out. And when he digs him out, he eats him. Oh, It's a terrible story, isn't it? We got poop and eating birds and birds falling out of that. But did you see all the forces at work? Now, you say that's an awful story, but there is three morals to this story. Are you ready? Number one, not everyone who poops on you is your enemy. Ah, oh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Come on now. Second, not everybody who digs you out is your friend. Oh, boy. And number three, when you're deep in the poop, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Come on, can we have some fun in church? Come on. All right. Okay, I said all that to show you that there are a lot of forces that go on in our life. Come on. Some of us have experienced different things and factors and forth. And so we're going to look at today, and our scripture reference is Luke 22, verses 31 to 32. Two verses. Simon, Simon. Now, you know, this is Peter, the disciple, who was Simon, and Jesus changed his name to Peter. Remember last week in our first message, again, if you missed it, go listen to it, but we talked about Peter. He was the classic example in Scripture of failure and redemption. And we looked at his journey and his life and how he failed and how God redeemed him and, and how it's redeemable in our life. And so now that we understand Peter, and we talked about that last week, now we're going to, like I said, look under the hood, look behind the scenes, and let's see what was at work in Peter's life that brought about the failure and redemption in his life. Okay? Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Come on, say fail not. Fail not. That your faith fail not. And when you are converted or when you bounce back, strengthen your brothers. Now, I see four forces there that we're going to talk about today. Four forces that are at work in failure and redemption as we look at part two of Courageous Failure. Number one, the first force is the force of sifting. The force of sifting. Now, I don't know if you understand the term sifting. If the word sift there... The Greek word means to shake or to agitate. How many have ever been shaken or agitated? Come on. How many know that's a force that's at work in life? Satan, who is a force, an evil force, has asked to sift or agitate or shake you as wheat. Now, sifting in the biblical times and sifting wheat was what a farmer would do. They had this Think of a wooden frame and a wire mesh 
kind of a thing, okay? They would harvest the grain, the pure grain that would have chaff or an outer husk or shell in it. They would put, they would pour the grain out of the bucket and put it in this sifter, in this frame wired thing, and they would shake it. They would agitate it so that the grain would separate from the chaff or the debris that was harvested it, okay? And what they would do is they would shake and they would agitate so that the pure grain would be left and the chaff would fall through the holes or blow away. And then when they would also do is they would take that grain and after they shook it a little bit, they would toss it up into the wind that the force of the wind then would blow away some of the chaff and the stuff. And then the grain would fall back into the wire sifter or strainer. How many have a kitchen strainer? Okay. So you know the idea of sifting. You, you take your, your fruit or your vegetables or your lettuce or in the morning when I have my blueberries with oatmeal, I'll take the blueberries and I'll wash them and I stick them in the strainer and you shake them and, and you want to get off all any, any of the stuff and it leaves the good stuff in the thing. So we all understand the idea of sifting. And so that's the picture that Jesus gives us when he tells Simon Peter that the enemy is there to sift him to shake him and to agitate him, just like to separate the impure from the pure. Now, we need to understand from this that there is evil forces in this world. Come on, if you watch your news, and we need to pray for what's going on in our world, and we need to pray for Israel, we need to pray for our country, we need to pray for all that's going on in our world. And we realize that there's evil. There are forces behind the scenes. And how many know they're not just work at work in the Middle East or around the world? How many know there's forces at work that are affecting our life? And these forces, they shake and they agitate or they deceive or they tempt. Deception, temptation. Come on, we know what it's like to be tempted. What's happening when we're tempted? We're being shaken. Are we going to give in or are we not going to give in? There's a shaking and agitation that goes on. And there's an enemy and there are evil forces that want us to fail. We need to understand that. We need to understand that there are real forces at work that want us to fail, that do not want us to succeed, that do not want us in the house of God, do not want us to worship God, do not want us to give our life to Jesus, do not want us to trust our families to God. There are forces that want us to fail. Jesus is telling Simon, listen, the first force you need to understand that's at work in life and a key to success is understanding that there are forces that want you to fail. Now, I don't believe we should go around looking for demons behind every bush and tree, but there are real evil forces. And listen, not only are there evil forces, how many know the enemy uses human people to be a force to shake and to agitate us? Come on, anybody ever have, don't raise your hand, but anybody ever have a human being agitate or shake you? There's sifting that goes on all the time. There's forces every day that we have to recognize that are want us to fail that day, want us to fail in the big picture. John 10 tells us there's a thief that doesn't use the door but climbs over the wall of the sheepfold. Sneaky. Think about that. Doesn't want to go through the door, but comes around over. There are forces that are sneaky and subtle. And the Bible says he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. We need to know that. We need to be aware of that. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18 tells us to be strong in the Lord. Why? Because We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Even though the enemy uses people, they're not really the enemy, but there is a spirit at work behind that. We're against principalities and powers and forces that we don't see that are at work so that we can stand against the wiles, the tricks, the strategies of the enemy. 1 Peter 5, 8 talks about that we need to be alert and aware because there's a roaring lion who seeks to devour. 
and we have to resist him steadfast. We have to not be ignorant of his devices, the Bible says. We need to understand that force that's at work at failure. So there is a force that wants us to fail. Now you say, why does God allow us to be shaken and agitated? Well, why does the farmer shake and agitate the grain to separate the pure from the debris and the unnecessary and the impure? God allows us to be shaken and agitated, not because he's against us, but because he's for us, and he wants us to stand strong and to trust him like we talked about and to resist steadfast. And while we know that the enemies come to steal, kill, and Jesus has come that we might have life and life abundant. And if we will trust him and we will allow, trust him through that and not give in to the temptation, not give in to the deception, how many know we'll get stronger each time and we'll get stronger each time and it'll separate the debris from the chat from the pure and he will make us pure and make us all that he wants to be and he wants to bring the best out of us like the farmer wants the pure grain and wants the chaff to go away first corinthians 10 gives us an example of israel and the early people of god they wandered in the wilderness they kept going in circles what should have taken 14 days to go from egypt to Canaan. Forty years and an entire generation was lost. Why? Because they kept giving in. They kept giving in to the temptation. They kept giving in to the deception. Every time they hit something hard, what did they do? They murmured and complained. The Red Sea, oh, you want us to die. We don't trust you. And, and God parted the Red Sea. They came and there was no water and they complained. God, we're out here to die. You gave us no water. And instead of standing strong and trusting God, they gave in to the temptation and God had to bring them around the mountain again. Some of us have circled the same mountain for so long it's because we haven't trusted God and let him shake off the debris and make us pure and make us who he wants us to be. The sifting is real, but we need to understand the forces at work. There's an enemy who doesn't want us to fail, but God allows it because he wants to bring out the best in us. And in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 10, the Bible says, take heed of this example, lest you fall into the same temptation. We can criticize them for murmuring and complaining in the wilderness, but we need to be careful that every time we hit a hard spot and every time we go through things, we don't murmur and complain and don't trust God. And when we do, we'll keep circling the same. How many know it's a test? And I don't know about you, but when I went to school, they didn't just pass you if you didn't finish the test and pass the test. Matter of fact, I retook some tests more than once until I got it. And sometimes we have to realize that, yes, the enemy's real, but God wants us to pass that test. And when we pass it, we can move on to the next stage. Verse 13 tells us that temptation is common to man, that God is faithful in the temptation, and that the, there's always a way of escape. We don't have to give in. We don't have to give up. How many know the whole goal of the enemy is to get us to act independent of God and to get us to give up? If he can get you and I to act independent of God, to go in our own strength, our own ability, or to give up and say, that's it, I can't take it, it's too hard, I can't, all these problems, all these things in life, I, I can't, instead of trusting God, he wants us to give up. And how many know there's always a way of escape, there's always an exit sign, there's always a door we can run to, there's always a place we can go, because God is faithful with the temptation. And even though it's common, he's faithful, and there's always a way of escape. Let's not be deceived, distracted, or defeated by the temptations of life or the agitations of life, the aggravations of life. And they're real, but God's faithful. And if we'll trust him, we can not only pass the test, but we can be better because of it. And we can be even stronger and better in it. Now listen, before we blame the enemy for everything, how we know in temptation, we have a choice. James tells us in James 1.13, 
that if we're drawn away, we're drawn away by our own lusts, our own desires. In other words, the enemy will encourage it. He wants us to fail. He'll do everything he can to get us to fail. He'll put every roadblock and every obstacle and every situation in our... But how many know if we give in, it's still our choice. And we have the choice. Do I trust God or do I give in or do I give up? And today, some may be facing a sifting experience in your life. You may be going through some shaking. Everything around you is shaken and, and you're agitated on all fronts or maybe in a certain area and you just don't know what to do. Listen, trust God. Don't give up. Don't act independent of God. Don't try to fix it yourself. Pray, seek the Lord, trust him, follow his plan. Let him work it out in his time and his way. And listen, if we'll let him do it in his work, he'll be faithful and bring us through victorious in the temptation. Second force. Not only is there the force of sifting, I like the next one. So if you didn't like that one, and I don't always like being sifted. Nobody likes to be shaken. But the next three we're going to have some fun with. Are you ready? Number two, the force of praying. Not only the force of sifting, Simon, Simon, Satan wants to sift you as we, but I love that. Simon, Satan wants to knock you down, wants you to fall down, wants you to give up, but I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. How many know force is a prayer? Prayer is a force, I mean. Prayer is a force that when we find ourselves in sifting, it's good that we, and important that we pray for ourselves. It's good and it's wonderful when people pray for us. But how many know it's even better and more powerful when Jesus is praying for us? That's the force we have. Yes, pray for yourself. Yes, ask other people to join you in agreement with prayer. But listen, know this and understand, no matter what sifting we go through, no matter what temptation we face, no matter what agitation takes place in life, know this, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God and he's making intercession for us and he is able to help those who have been strengthened in this time of need. There are evil forces that we have to understand that are at work in life that want us to fail but how many know God and Jesus does not want us to fail? And if God be for us, who or what can be against us? Greater is he that is in us praying for us. Spirit will pray through us with intercession and groanings that we know. Jesus is in us and praying for. Listen, with that kind of force on our side, no matter what the sifting or agitation, come on somebody. Think about this. Jesus has, you know, did you realize Jesus already prayed for you and I in the Bible? It's in the Bible. I'm going to show you in a minute. Jesus has prayed for us and he is right now praying for you. If you'll trust him in what's going on, you'll say, Jesus, I invite you into my life. Jesus, I need you. I invite you into the situation. Listen, at that moment, he will pray for you. He is seated at the right hand of God. He is making intercession for us. He's praying for us today. You see, while there is evil forces in this world, understand that there is divine power that's greater also at work behind the scenes. How many know God is with us? God is for us. And God doesn't want us to fail. And he has and he is praying for us. I want that to just sink in for a moment. Think about this. Jesus himself, not an angel, not seraphims, not the pastor. Though it's all good, that's all good and fine. But Jesus himself, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke creation into existence, the one who holds the world together in his arms, the one who spoke miracles and healed the lame and the blind and, and the one who walked this earth and spoke like no other, the one who is the savior of the world, the one who is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the prince of peace, the son of God, the Christ, the living God, the Messiah. Think about it. He's the one who's praying for me. He's the one who's praying for you today. Think about that. Let that sink in. Jesus is praying for me. Say that. Jesus is praying for me. 
Make it personal. He's praying for me right now. He wants me not to fail. He said, I'm praying, Simon, that you fail not. Your faith will not give up. Your faith will not get so weary. Your faith will not get so worn out. You won't give up. Let me show you in John 17. It's called the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Listen to these words. Jesus, verse 1, it says, Look toward heaven and prayed. Father, I pray for them. Now he identifies who them are. And notice this. I am not praying for the world. I'm praying for those you have given me. Think about that. Jesus said this particular prayer is not for the world. Now how many know we should pray for the world? And it's okay to pray. And God cares about what goes on in the world. But in this particular prayer, Jesus wanted his disciples to understand. This particular prayer, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for you. Praying for you, my disciples. He says to God, I'm praying for the ones that you gave me. Think about that. For they're yours. I love this. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name so that they may be one as we are one. My prayer for them, for the disciples then, is not that you would take them out of this world. I mean, no, we shouldn't ask Jesus to take us out of this world. One day he's going to come back and he will take us out. How I many know that shouldn't be our prayer? It wasn't Jesus' prayer. Oh, boy. Oh, I just want to escape this big, no, no, Jesus has us here for a reason, so don't ask for that prayer. I pray that you don't take them out of this world, but that you protect them in this world from the evil one. Now notice this, watch this. I'm praying, Lord, not just, not Father, not just for them alone, for his disciples then, watch this, but for all those who would believe your message after them. How many believed in Jesus' message after the original disciples? Come on, let me see your hand. If you believed in Jesus after, if you believed in the message of Jesus after the disciples lived and you were a disciple and a follower of God, Jesus prayed back in John 17, not just for his disciples then, but he's prayed for you and me then. You didn't know you were in the Bible. I pray not for them alone, the ones you gave me now, but for all those who will believe that they too may be one, listen, that the world may believe. Why is he praying for us? Why is he keeping us here? Why does he want to protect us from evil? Why does he want to do good and not evil? Why does he want us to be an influence in this world? So that the rest of the world will know. So the rest of the world can have peace. So the rest of the world can have hope. So the rest of the world can have eternal life. Jesus prayed for you and I that we would be one. I wish I could say that that prayer has been answered totally. But I mean, no, Jesus hasn't given up on his church. And he's coming back for a glorious and united church. And it's, I think we're beginning to realize, look, we're better off sticking together. Come on. Well, they don't believe quite like I did. Do they know Jesus? They loved you. They invited Jesus in heart. Listen, come on now. We've got to stop fighting with each other. Mm -hmm. I don't believe they're the Antichrist. They're not the When he's coming, I don't. We fight over stuff that don't matter. There's a world out there that needs to know. And if they keep looking at the church, fighting with each other and fussing with each other, that's not our enemy. There's a real enemy. There's real evil that needs a united church to stand up in the power of Jesus and to fulfill his prayer that we might be one. Listen, that the glory, that they may be one, that the world may believe that you sent me and that the glory that I've given them, I will give it to you. How many would like some of that glory this morning? How many would like, come on, lift your hand with me a moment, right where you are. If you're going through a sifting right now, if you're going through a shaking, if you're going, just even if everything's perfect in your world, there'll be one if you're either coming into a problem, going to exit one, or about to go into a new one. So listen, lift your hand a moment. You need to be ready. And you need to know Jesus is praying and say, Jesus, thank you that you're praying for me right now. 
And Jesus, I pray that you'll protect me from the evil one. Protect my family from evil in this world. Protect my home and my life and my family. Protect us from evil, Lord. And Lord, help us to be one. That the world may believe in you. And that we might receive your glory today. Lord, fill us with your glory right now. Thank you that you prayed that for us. And we receive it by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is praying for you. Listen to this. Romans 8, 33 and 34. Who shall lay anything against the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it that condemns? Who are we to condemn others and each other? It says Christ died and rose again. He's the only one who's the judge and jury. It is Christ who sits at the right hand of God and makes intercession for us. Realize we've got the King of Kings, the Creator, sitting at the right hand of God right now, praying for you and me, praying for Bethel Christian Church, praying for our world, praying for the glory of the church. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 16 to 18, chapter 4, 14 to 16, chapter 7, 23 to 24. Hebrews, look at, listen to all this. Truly, I love that. Truly, Jesus took not on the nature of angels, but the seed of Abraham to become like us that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest of all things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For he himself was tempted. The enemy tried to sift him and shake him and defeat him and make him fail on his mission. But he overcame. It says he was tempted, but he, and he is able to strengthen those who have been tempted. Since we have a great high priest who is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to the profession of our faith. Don't give in. Don't give up. Don't act independent of God. Trust him. For we have a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities and our weaknesses. In all points was tempted and shaken as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us go boldly before the throne room of grace that we might obtain mercy and find help in our time of need. Listen, we need to go to God today and say, Jesus, you're at the right hand of God. And I pray to you because you are going to pray for me. Now notice this, and I never really spend a lot of time on these next verses, but it really rung out to me as I was going over this the other day. Many priests, high, many priests have died and not continued in their office. But because Jesus lives forever, his is a permanent priesthood. Did you catch that? I can pray for you, but someday I'll pass on. And there are others who prayed for me when I had my parents and other pastors and other people prayed for me, and they've passed on. And thank God they're in the cloud of witnesses, and one day we'll join that cloud of witnesses. But you know what? Jesus' priesthood and his prayers are permanent. You say, well, I wish I still had my mom crying out in her bedroom, and I remember those nights hearing my mother pray for me and my brother and sister. I remember hearing her cry out to God for our souls and our lives. And I'm thankful for that. And sometimes I miss that. But better than even that, Jesus. His priesthood is permanent. He's praying for you right now. And listen, therefore, since he has a permanent priesthood, he is able to save completely those who come to him, come to God through him, because he ever lives to make intercession for us. Okay. Force number three, I got to keep going here. Number one, the force of sifting. Number two, the force of praying. Number three, the third force at work in failure is the force of rebounding. Rebounding. Verse 32, Simon, Simon, Satan would sift you as we, but I'm praying for you that you fail not. And when you are converted or when you bounce back or when you come back from failure, When you rebound from failure, go and strengthen your brothers. When you fall down, you can bounce back. You can rebound. Now, I played high school basketball. I played a little bit in college. I was was tall. I hate to admit I was taking piano lessons, and the basketball coach said, you're really tall. You should play basketball. 
I wish I still knew how to play the piano instead of played basketball, because I mean, I didn't make it very far after a little bit of college. But anyways, the art and the ability of rebounding is key in basketball. Anybody knows anything about basketball? And I remember I, I was a youngster in a high school team, and I wanted to play so badly on the high school basketball team. And I knew I wasn't the best, so I said to the coach, what do I have to do to not only make the team, but I want to play. I want to, I want to start. I want to, be on the field. I want to be on the court. And I'll never forget, he said, well, he said, look, you're really tall, you got long arms, and you got a nice-sized trunk. <laughs> Boy, talking about poop and trunks and... <laughs> This has really gotten away from me today. Sorry, Mom. And he said, you get me 10 rebounds a game, and you'll play. Don't worry about scoring. Don't worry about shooting. Don't worry about being a star. Don't worry about impressing the girls. You fight in the lane, and you box people out, and you work hard, and you press, and you go up, and you retrieve me 10 rebounds a night, and you'll be on my team. I said, you got it. And that was my job. I never scored a lot of points. I never was the star. I never made the paper too much. But how many know that was key to the success of our team? What do, what do they teach you in rebounding? They teach you to retrieve a missed shot. When we miss, when the player misses on the court, how many know the team is not taught to quit? Up, oh, we miss. That's it. Game's over. No. You go back up for the ball. You go retrieve the ball. If you miss, how many know you keep missing, you keep going back for the ball? You miss, you get back up for the ball. You rebound. You don't quit. You don't give up and say, oh, I messed up. I failed. I missed. I might as well quit. No. The force of rebounding. And notice this. We have to do something in that. We have a part to play in that. Jesus is praying for us. But how I many know we have to have a part in it? We have to. Simon, when you rebound, how I many know God won't pick us up? How I many know God's not going to come to our house and pick us up off the couch and drag us to church? God's not going to pick us up out of the thing and, and, and make us. Go back into the game and come on, how I many know we have to pick ourselves up? Jesus is praying for it. We've got that great force at work, but how I many know there has to be a force that comes within us that says, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm not going to stay here. I'm not going to stay in this place. I'm going to do something about it. You know, there was a woman in the Bible in Mark 5 that said she had an issue with of blood. Some had some kind of blood disease. And the Bible says that her first shot at getting better, she missed. She went to doctors, and while nothing wrong with going to doctors, and even then they went to doctors, and Jesus didn't condemn that. But she, the doctors couldn't help her, so that was a missed shot. I mean, no, she didn't quit because she missed the shot. Then it says she took all her money and resources and spent all that she had looking for answers, trying anything and everything, and she missed again with her finances. She didn't quit because she missed medically and because she missed financially. And then it says that she didn't even get better, she got worse. Wow. She heard Jesus was in town and that he was doing miracles. And she crawled to her door and she saw the streets were lined with people. She said, there's no way I'm going to get there. But how many know there was something in that woman that said, I'm not going to quit because I missed. I'm not going to quit because I missed. I'm not going to quit because I missed. I'm going to get out. And the Bible says she crawled through the crowd. She boxed out. Come on. I mean, when you go for a rebound, it's a crowded lane. What is the lane? The lane is the basketball lane where everybody is converging to go. Everybody's converging. And you got to box out and you got to clear a path and you got to plow through the lane. And here was a woman. The Bible says she crawled on her knees 
through the crowd. And she pushed her way and pressed her way to Jesus. And the Bible says she reached up with whatever strength she had left and she touched the hem of his garment. And the Bible says this woman who missed on everything bounced back, rebounded, pushed through. She didn't let the crowd stop her. She didn't let the fact that the doctors couldn't do anything. She didn't let the fact that all her money couldn't change it. She didn't let the fact that there was nothing else she could do humanly and we should do everything we can humanly. But when we fall or we miss, how many know we have to realize and within us ask God to give us the strength because we know God's praying for us. God's with us. We need to grab hold of the courage and the strength and the spirit that's within us and rise up and press through the crowd and touch the heaven of his garment and when we touch the hem of his garment the Bible says imagine this Jesus said who touched me now there's people everywhere you ever been in a crowd and everybody's hitting everybody everybody he said who touched me and then he looked and he saw the woman and the Bible says he looked at her and not only did he heal her he said daughter go in faith your faith has made you Listen, we need to not only understand that there's an enemy trying and wants us not to fail, wants us to fail, that Jesus is praying for us not to fail, but how many know we have to allow ourselves to rebound and take the force, the spirit that's with us and rise up? And realize we have a part in this. We have to do something. We have to take a step of faith. Anybody who ever saw a miracle took a step of faith. How many know if they don't step into the river, it doesn't part? If David doesn't pick up a sling and a stone, Goliath doesn't fall. If the little boy doesn't give his five loaves and two fishes, a multitude doesn't eat. Listen, there's always some small part that we have to do. And today we need to say, God, help me to understand what is it you want me to do? What is my part in this? so that I can see you do a miracle in my life and I can rebound and bounce back. First Samuel 30, David and his men come home from fighting a battle. They were doing good things, the right things. And the Bible says that they came home to a city that was burned. Their homes were destroyed and their wives and their children were taken captive. It can't get any worse than that, folks. And the Bible says they wept. Grown men, military soldiers, wept until they had no more strength to weep. Notice the emotion. The Bible says David was greatly distressed. Not just distressed, he was greatly distressed. His men spoke of stoning him because they had to blame someone. How many know we always want to blame someone? So David was the easy one. You took us out to battle because we were fighting for you. Our children were taken, our wives were taken, our city was burned. They spoke of stoning him. Think about what's going on. They're weeping. There's distress. They're talking about stoning. They're turning on each other. Their souls were grieved. There was human internal forces going on. And the Bible says in verse 8, with all that going on, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. David decided to pick himself up by his bootstraps and say, I'm sick and tired of this. I'm not going to let this get to me. I can't listen to what they're saying about me. I can't worry about this. I can't do anything about this, but I'm going to get up and I'm going to do something. I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to turn to God. And the Bible says he encouraged himself. Sometimes, listen, if the, even if there's nobody else that will encourage you, we have to have the ability to encourage ourselves. We have to have, have you ever talked to yourself? How about telling yourself, I can do this. Get up. Let's go. Stop sitting and wallowing in this. Stop fussing and worrying. Stop listening. Stop reading what they're saying on Facebook. Stop listening to what this one said. Stop checking about this. Stop watching the news all day long and start getting in your Bible. Start turning to Jesus. Start looking up. Start asking God for help. Listen, how about we start doing some? David encouraged himself in the Lord. And then he did this. He inquired of the Lord. And he said, Lord, shall I pursue them? Shall I overtake them? And you know what the Lord said? Go ahead, pursue them. And surely you'll overtake them and you will recover all. 
Everything you lost, everything that was taken from you, everything that was gone is going to be recovered, is going to be rebounded, is going to be given back to you. How many know what the enemy has stolen, God wants to replace with something even better? He inquired of the Lord. The Bible says he took 400 men with him. 200 stayed behind because they were too faint and too tired. Let's not be part of the 200 that are too faint. Eh, nothing's got, I might as well just live in this. I might as well just accept it. No, how about, how about we just pursue God and pursue his plan and purposes? And the Bible says that with 200, with 400 men, David smote the Amalekites from the dawn until dusk, and he recovered everything. Everything. Philippians 3, 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul said, I've not arrived and I'm not perfect, but I've been shipwrecked and beaten and faced all kinds of tragedies in life. He says, but I follow after and apprehend or grab hold of everything that Jesus has grabbed hold of me for. I count myself not to have apprehended, but one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind and I reach for those things that are behind and I press toward the mark of the high call. Listen, when there's a crowd around us and there's a lot of things going on and when our lentil field is full, how many know that's when we got to make a stand and that's when we got to pick ourselves up and we know that when we get knocked down, we can rebound and we can recover it all. We've got to forget the things that are behind and we've got to press forward. Come on, it's time. Today is the day that someone's going to say, it's time for me to press forward. I've been on neutral or I've been in reverse too long. It's time to shift into drive. Maybe four-wheel drive. Number four, I've got to stop. Oh boy. Number four. The first force is the force of sifting. Evil forces that work behind the scenes. The force of praying, divine power in us and praying for us and with us. The force of rebounding, internal human force where we grab hold of God and we take a step of faith. And the last and the fourth is the force of supporting. The force of supporting. Simon, Simon, the enemy would sift you, but I'm praying for you. And when you're converted, when you rebound, go and strengthen and support your brothers. How many know when we get a victory, it's not just for us to get a victory. That victory is for us to help somebody else. God doesn't just bless us for us to be blessed. Oh, how blessed I am. He blessed you so you can bless someone else. Come on. Oh. <laughs> See, there's a powerful force there of strengthening, helping others in their time. And you say, Pastor, I need help myself. You know what? Sometimes the best time to help someone is when you need help. It's amazing how that works. Not only do you help you forget about what you're dealing with and distract you a little bit, but you help someone, you bless someone, you support someone, you encourage. It's amazing how better you'll feel. Understand that there is a spiritual force that's crucial to success and failure in life, and that is the power of supporting and helping one another not to fail. There's evil that wants us to fail. Jesus doesn't want us to fail. There's an inner force that we have to draw from to help us to, 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 to not fail. But how many know there's that supporting and helping others to not fail? I'm going to ask two people. You know, Steve and Rodney, come up here a minute. You guys are close. I promise, I, I won't let you play with my toy, but... No, I'm only kidding. Come here a second. Exodus 17, there's a story. I'm going to tell you a story. I want both of you to lift your arms up. Go ahead, lift your arms up. Hold them up high, okay? There's a story in Exodus 17. Just hold them up. No, don't mind me. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you in just a moment. I promise I won't forget about you, okay? There's a story in Exodus 17 about Amalek comes to fight against Israel at Rephidim. And Moses says, God says to Moses, and Moses says to Joshua, go get some men and go fight. He goes out to fight, and the Bible says Moses said, because God told him, to go up on the mountain and stand there and to hold your arms up. 
And as long as Moses' arms was up, Israel prevailed. They were winning the battle. When his arms got heavy and they came down, keep them up. <laughs> they getting heavy yet? All right, okay. You okay over here? All right, okay, good. Thank you. When his arms got heavy, what happened? Amalek prevailed. So what did they do? The Bible says they took a stone and they told Moses, here, take a seat. And Aaron and her, Aaron and her held up, one on each side, held up Moses' arms all the way till the dawn and the dusk. And the Bible says, Joshua smote Amalek. I love the word smote. You know that? I could interpret that differently, but you know what it means. I just love when the Bible says, I, that's one of the King James words I love. Not all King James words do I like, but smote is so good. Come on, you got to admit, that's a good word. He smote him, man. Okay. Anyways, I digress. You guys okay over here? All right, okay. Who, I don't know who thinks they're the toughest guys over here, but... Getting heavy there, buddy? No, I'm good. Oh, he's good. How about you? You okay? You need help? You need help? I'm all right for now. You're okay? Oh, nobody, nobody needs my help. Okay. All right, let me keep going. <laughs> up, 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 up. Get, get those arms up. Boy, good help's hard to find these days. I don't know. I'm the only kid. Here, here's the point I want to make. Let's say I come over here, or let's say I come over here, and I say, Rodney, just relax your arms. I got this. Steve, you okay? Now, how many know if we did this for a long time? Eventually, you get the point. Come on. There's the point. Holding these arms up. Good. You guys can go. I'm, I'm only messing with you. I just want to... I just wanted to show you. Here's the point. Look, all of us get tired of fighting. Come on. We all get weary. You know, even Jesus got weary. It says he got weary. He sat down by the well and needed something to drink. He got weary. Even, look, and you know what? We all need someone to hold our arms up in the battle. And I love the fact that Aaron and her stood there. And I love the fact that Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, you're going to mess up, but you're going to rebound. I'm praying for you. And every time you rebound, you go find somebody else to help who can understand what you went through and can identify with you. And you, you, you had a victory over this because you're going to help someone else get through it as well. Can I say to you this morning, it's not the reason why God allows it. It's not the reason... But how many know there's an added bonus to the fact that when we mess up or we go through problems or we face things, and when God helps us and we trust him and we overcome, how many know he wants us then to help others get through the same thing? Isn't that a beautiful picture? One helping another. Galatians 6, 1 to 5 says, if a person is overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore them. With a spirit of meekness, not with weakness, but firm gentleness. How I many know you can be firm and straight and still be gentle? Considering yourself lest you fall and you need someone to help. Bear one another's burdens. The word bear there means to lift up and to hold up and to help carry one another's burdens. So fulfill the law of Christ. For if one thinks they are better than others and doesn't need to help anyone, they deceive themselves. Let everyone prove his own work so that they can rejoice. In other words, feel good about themselves and have dignity. How many know? We, we, no one should ever want to have to rely on everybody else all the time, but every once in a while we all need help. Listen, we're not called to support people in the sense we do it all for them and we enable them and, and we carry all the load and we have to be their savior. No. Everybody has to prove their own load and their own responsibility. Jesus even said that. That's the law of God. That's the word of God. Everybody has to carry. But if people are carrying their own load, it's okay every once in a while to need help. And when they need help, that's when we need to help. Now, you can't support them forever and you can't do everything. And you can't, again, you can't enable people. But when people need help and when they are, if they're doing the right things and they're doing what God is, and they're trying to do, that's when we need to help. And we need to bear one another's burden. People don't want to rely on everybody else to help them. They want to stand on their own two feet. 
They want to carry their own responsibility. They want to carry their own burdens. But in those times, extreme times, when we need help, it's okay to say, would you pray for me? Would you help me? It's okay for us if we see someone hurting and in need and we see that there's a situation and we know that they're trying and they're doing what they... It's okay to say, look, I, can do, I can't do everything, but I can do this. And a little bit here and a little bit there. How many know just a little extra under the arms makes the difference? That's the force at work. Hebrews 10, 23 tells us, hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering. We need to be strong on our own. But then we also need to consider others and spur them on to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. Do you realize we held each other's arms just by being here today? Just by showing up today, you held up my arms and we're holding up each other's arms because we gain strength just from being with each other. He says, not rely, he, says, he says, not forsaking yourself, as some do. He says, but encourage one another, even as you see the evil days. I'm going to wrap up. Here's my closing. Here, we've got to finish. I know you, you could say amen to that. Here we go. Jesus is with us. Jesus is for us. Jesus does not want us to fail. But if we fail, we can recover from it. We can learn from it. And we can help others with it. That's the bottom line.